We're exploring tonight building community and I want to share with you some of the insights and learnings and practices of um, a community that's been around for 2,500 years, the um, Sangha of the Buddha, a community of monks and nuns and lay practitioners um, that has managed to remain quite strong throughout um, two and a half millennia. I also want to say that I, I grew up in a Christian community that was um, founded on a monastic model, although it was a lay uh, community, people with families, um, spouses. So I, I was born into that community, um, an intentional community that was doing village development and human development uh, all over the world. And lived in this community till I was 14. So um, <coughs> there was just a few years of my life that I wasn't in community. <laughs> um, high school and college. And, and even that was very much a community. So that's what I'm drawing from personally, my history and, and um, this tradition that I'm a part of, which is that of Thich Nhat Hanh. <clears throat> so, Thich Nhat Hanh uh, says that Sangha building or community, Sangha means community in Sanskrit, is the most noble task that to uh, use our lives to create community is the most important thing we can do for ourselves and for our world. And Martin Luther King Jr. also had as his aim the creation of a beloved community. So he was working for civil rights, but that wasn't ultimately his, his aim political freedom and equality. He really was, had a, a deeper spiritual focus, which was brotherhood and sisterhood, to create a community where uh, everyone belonged. So in all of the work of civil rights, the aim wasn't to conquer an enemy, but to transform an enemy into a friend. And the beloved community was based on the idea of um, agape love. So the three different kinds of love in the Greek philosophy. Uh, agape was not the love of um, friendship or passionate love where you love based on what you get in return or you love um, because of similarities and because people are, um, are like you and familiar to you. But agape love is the love of um, the love for someone because they need to be loved, <laughs> because we all need to be loved. And, uh, and Thich Nhat Hanh says, a real love isn't loving those who are easy to love. That's too easy. <laughs> that's, a, that's what we all do. If someone's sweet, someone's fresh, someone's kind, of course we love them. But he says real love is um, loving the difficult people, the people who are hard to love, who disappoint us or we don't understand. And so this um, understanding of community 
in, in these two practitioners' uh, lives, Thich Nhat Hanh and Martin Luther King, are very similar. It's a huge, it's a boundless love that we're cultivating. That's what creates, that's what allows us to create community, to be um, to ourselves be really grounded in community, to give ourselves to community, is this um, challenge uh, to move into a space of, of love that's not always so uh, easy or comfortable. And there's just a very nice quote of Thich Nhat Hanh. He says, I've been a monk for 65 years, so now it's 70 or something. (laughs) But he says, I've been a monk for 65 years, and what I have found is that there is no religion, no philosophy, no ideology higher than brotherhood and sisterhood, not even Buddhism. So this putting right at the center, this... real uh, commitment and valuing of, of love, of real engaging with each other as brothers and sisters. When, when t- we call Thich Nhat Hanh Thai, it just means teacher in Vietnamese. And when he came to Germany um, some years ago, he said that he was walking through the halls of the institute and he looked out the window and he saw a group of brothers and sisters sitting together and sharing and <clears throat> playing, being together. And he uh, understood in that moment that, that that sight, that image of brothers and sisters being together was more beautiful than the most famous masterpiece. For him, that was really... Um, what it was all about, what this whole path is all about. <clears throat> so, this growing of our hearts to embrace everyone, you know, that's um, I'll speak more about Scott Peck, maybe towards the end of the talk, but this is a, someone who's written quite a bit about community. And he says, the mark of real community is that it's inclusive. And so I know that for me, in our um, monastic sangha, um, I think the places I've grown the most and learned the most have have been in the relationships that were difficult with the people I found difficult to accept or to understand. That's um, where I found um, the most fulfillment, I would say, in terms of my own um, deepening. Thinking, oh, this person, I, I cannot... I don't think I can really ever make it with them. I can, I'm, I'm, they're too difficult. Or I just don't understand them. And, and then to keep sticking with the practice and with that relationship and to have it transform. Because when we are committed to a, a, a practice, We're always transforming, even if we don't see it. And the other person is also always transforming. So to arrive at these moments where somebody who I hadn't been able to trust or hadn't been able to open up to or had a real block with, and then maybe some years later was able to really see who they were and really touch their goodness and 
and not know their suffering, you know. Because we know that people who create suffering are suffering themselves. And if we can see that, then we have compassion for their suffering. But to, to, to see that it was really possible to uh, transform difficult relationships and brought me some of my deepest happinesses in my life. To, um, to see a part of my heart that I had shut down be able to open up. Um, not because the other person became <clears throat> who I wanted them to be or changed to suit me better, but because I, I, could, I could get bigger. <laughs> And in me not uh, wishing them to be different, they could trust more and be more of who they were and be more at ease and share their beauties more because there wasn't this subtle um, demand that they change. And in, in those um, most difficult relationships, I really learned how much I caused my own suffering by, by thinking that someone else can make me happy, <laughs> that my happiness depends on whether they do the things that I want them to do or not. So there was immense freedom in, in realizing, oh, it's actually up to me. Um, and in opening up to who they were fully, <coughs> there were parts of their, um, their gifts that were able to emerge that um, might not have otherwise emerged. Sure, it was reciprocal, that there were things that arose in me because of that relationship and precisely because of the friction that called up things in me that otherwise wouldn't have come up. So... We had a beautiful beginning of our Enterprising Futures course on Monday with sharing of experiences around enterprise, around work, around making money. And I was really struck by the participants sharing how um, how fundamental the experience of community was to a sense of meaning and purpose and fulfillment in their work. That um, they were willing to work all hours of the night and for many days on end for something, first of all, that they believed in, but also something that they really did with a group of people who were also committed to this goal or to this um, wish to realize something. Um, and this, the experience of um, opening, of real aliveness when, there were, when hierarchies broke down and when there was this real intimacy between people they were working with and, and a trust. And um, <coughs> it sounded like those were some of the most fulfilling moments for people in, in their work lives. Mm. Just to share a, the brief, um, an experience from 
the very brief time I was working before becoming a, a nun. Um, I was uh, working for a community center in a low-income Latino neighborhood in Denver. <clears throat> and um, they served, you know, immigrants and poor people and helped them get homes and jobs and learn English and worked with children and... Um, Every week we'd have meetings, and we were invited to bring something to celebrate, you know, to share our joys or our successes. That that was a, how we began each meeting that week. That was an experience of community for me, of taking time to connect with each person as a human being, with an emotional life, with relationships, with community. And the person I worked for, uh, one of the co-founders of this organization, her name is Lorraine Granado, and she worked a lot in environmental justice as well. Because in that neighborhood, um, as is often the case in poor areas and people of color, that's a term we use in the United States, non-white people, um, there's often, uh, that's often where a lot of pollution gets dumped and, and there's environmental injustice. So in her neighborhood, there was a lot of pollution from a local chemical factory, and many people had thyroid problems from the pollution. So she successfully uh, led a, a legal campaign against this company. She was able to get them to remove the top six inches of soil in the whole neighborhood and replace it because it was so toxic. But this was an example of agape love because she did this without creating enemies in this company. She, it wasn't done with hatred or with anger, but with a sense of how can we... Um, create justice here and transformation of everyone in this situation. So the company ended up becoming a friend of the neighborhood and agreed to have a certain number of jobs that would go to people from the neighborhood. And they worked together after that, even though the, the company lost in the legal sense, everybody gained. So just wanted to share an example of how a community can be transformative in, a, in an organization. So how do we create community? I'm going to draw just a diagram that I think may be helpful. So a community is made of individuals. And if we can come back to ourselves as an individual to take care of our own body and mind, to create happiness and well-being inside of us, then we have a real chance at 
helping create more happiness and more peace around us. So we just draw this arrow for this coming home to ourselves. This mm, journey to really be with what our own situation is that we may be alienated from with all of the stresses and the demands and um, projects and worries that we have. We may forget that we have a body when we sit at the computer for long hours or get so caught up in our thoughts, in our mind world, that we we can really be disconnected from what's happening in our whole being. So this coming back to ourselves is about stopping and calming and healing and really being there for ourselves. So the practices of mindful breathing that we did with the bell at the beginning, mindful walking. You don't you don't just have to have a a sitting cushion or a It's not only in sitting meditation that we can come back to ourselves. We can come back to ourselves all throughout the day. When we walk with awareness, when we walk and we know we're walking, and we walk with our feet and not with our head, when we walk and we allow ourselves to be fully in that step, So our mind and our body are really there when we take a step. We're not already at our destination, but we're really at home, right where we are. We know we have a body. We know we're taking a step. We know if it's our left foot or if it's our right foot. We know if we're breathing in or if we're breathing out. Then we're walking as a free person. We're not walking enslaved by our projects and our plans and our to-do lists. And there are Congress people and business people who have learned walking meditation and they practice it in their daily lives. There's a congressman who shared with us after coming on a retreat for Congress people that Thich Nhat Hanh and a number of us held in Washington, D.C. He walks from his office to where he goes to vote in walking meditation. And he says this helps him to make a better choice when he votes. There are business women and men who, who do walking meditation to their meetings or around their offices not rushing, but really taking that time to practice, to come home to themselves in their every step. Mm -hmm. So when they arrive to the meeting, they're fully present. They can really listen. They can really speak from their heart. They're not pushed by their emotions and their reactions. So when we are successful at coming home to ourselves to take care of our stress and our tension, which if we don't pay attention to it, it accumulates throughout the day. And then we wonder why we're so tired in the evening. 
It's because we've been carrying tension many hours and our back hurts and our shoulder hurts and we have a headache because we haven't been aware that we have this tension that's just stuck in our bodies. So every time we breathe in and out mindfully or take a few steps mindfully, it's a chance for us to release tension so that it doesn't accumulate throughout the day. So we we learn to know ourselves. We learn to, to check in regularly with ourselves. And as we become successful at that, we can help those close to us to also come home to themselves. So our coming home to ourselves is a, a force field that influences those in our family, those, in our, those friends, those that are close to us, to come home to themselves. When we are really present with our own experience, then when we are close to someone, in our family, our friends, then we really are present for them. And when we're present for them, they, they know this. They feel it. We're not dispersed and worried and listening to them with just one ear and what they say goes in one ear and out the other. They feel that we're really there. And this is a, a gift And it allows them to get in touch with how they're feeling, what's really going on with them. And this bringing them back to be in touch with themselves can also be expressed through our appreciation, our seeing, recognizing, speaking out what what we appreciate about them, what's good about them, to help that to grow. Because as we learn this practice of coming home to ourselves, there are four things that we want to be doing, the four aspects of right diligence. We want to bring up the positive things that are inside of us, We all have many positive um, potentials or seeds in us. And we need to bring those up because they're always there. And we can bring them up anytime. Our happiness, our gratitude, our forgiveness, our understanding, our mindfulness. Those are things that are there in our... um, unconscious. They're always available. So a very important practice is to make them come up, to stimulate them, to water them so that they grow. That's one. Another one is when they arise, the positive seeds, positive mental states, we nourish them so that they stay for a long time. We want them to really grow. Every time mm, the energy of humor or of connection or acceptance is there in our waking mind, in our experience, it's getting stronger. We're cultivating it. So we have more access to it in the future. This neural pathways thing, when we create a neural pathway, it's easier to do it the next time. So it's easier to feel gratitude It comes up quicker, it lasts longer. So that's the second. We bring up the positive and we keep the positive there as long as we can. So we cultivate it. And the other two are the mirror image of the first two. We try not to bring up the seeds of suffering, the experiences that make us and others suffer. We selectively water the seeds in in the garden of our mind, in the soil of our consciousness. 
And when, and the fourth one is when seeds of suffering arise, we try to help them calm down. We take care of them as soon as we can. We don't let them be taking over our, our mind for a long time. Because if anger or despair or frustration, if it takes us over and we don't realize it and we allow it to express and grow for 20 minutes or an hour, that's 20 minutes or an hour of feeding our anger, of eating anger, eating irritation, despair. So it's very important to catch it and to have a skillful way to be with it so that it doesn't um, proliferate because it will call up other negative states of mind. And then it becomes a big ball, a big block of suffering. So these four things we need to do are not only for us, but also for others. So helping our loved ones come back to themselves means watering their good seeds, bringing up the positive things in them. Maybe it's not manifesting. Maybe we know that our um, beloved one um, is a really good painter or (coughs) really creative when it comes to making things. But they've been sort of not in such a great space and not, not in touch with that. So we have to water that and encourage them to, to do what they really do well and what makes them feel good, what makes them in touch with their own aliveness. And in the same vein, we, we practice not to water the seeds of suffering in them. To... Um, help the seeds of suffering in them be recognized, be embraced when they arise. When I was, uh, this was some years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, Ty, Ty was there in a meeting with us and I was organizing something with a sister and we were arguing. <laughs> We were upset at each other, and I think it was very obvious in our faces that we weren't, get, weren't managing to get through this conflict. And Ty, out of the blue, he just looked at me, he said, sing a song. <laughs> so he was watering my, my good seeds in a moment where I was letting myself be consumed by my anger. He was saying, oh, you have another seed in you. I want you to water that seed. And it helped, you know. I knew what he was doing, so I also felt a little bit ashamed. (laughs) But I also was grateful because singing helped. It changed the, the peg, we say. It changed the CD. I had a CD on of music that wasn't very good. So I had a chance, well, I don't need to play that CD. I can change it. And so as we do this with our, the people close to us in our life, the third area is that with our loved ones who now have this capacity to come back to themselves, we bring that into our work lives. So with our, our families, we create environments in our work where the community as a whole can come back to itself, can refresh itself, can slow down and be in touch with what's really going on and not just f- pushed and under pressure and under stress. Because um, stress is contagious. You've probably experienced being around someone who's very agitated. It kind of 
it can ripple into us, right? And ease and peace is also contagious. So if we create environments in our, in our companies, in our organizations that allow people to come back, to have an experience of peace, that's, that becomes part of the collective memory that people can tap into. And one person breathing mindfully at a meeting can change the whole meeting. One person that's not caught up in their reactivity, in their emotions, can really have an effect on the whole meeting. (coughs) So uh, two weeks ago, uh, myself and Sophie Banks, we co-led a retreat together, a course at uh, Elmhurst. It was the first course (coughs) at Elmhurst. And Sophie Banks is from the Transition Town Totnes uh, organization. And uh, she gave a good example of this. She spoke about the burnout and the, the real suffering that also is there in activist organizations that are trying to make a change in the world. That if they don't know how to come back to themselves, to take good care of themselves, and they just replicate some of the stress and tension and conflict that they're trying to alleviate in the world. So she spoke about something that the Transition Town Totnes movement had really um, awakened to, and that was the need to balance the doing with the being. So she said every... um, they alternate. One month they have a doing meeting where they speak about, you know, projects and work and goals and responsibilities. And then the next month they have a being meeting where they speak about how they're doing. They take time to listen to each other, to work through conflicts, to um, support each other, to challenge each other not just to go along with something if it's not working. And every meeting, whether it's a doing meeting or a being meeting, begins with a 10-minute check-in, or a check-in. It begins with a check-in, and it ends with 10 minutes of reflection. So at the end, whatever has come up, people have a chance to look at it together before the meeting ends. This coming back to ourselves is also, um, it's a practice of joy. It's this nourishing ourselves, watering the good seeds. It's about celebration, which is something I'm very... um, inspired by here at Schumacher. I think Schumacher really has this down. (laughs) We know about celebrating (laughs) at every chance we get, whether it's singing or dancing or playing or relaxing or expressing gratitude. But I don't know if you're familiar with Dragon Dreaming, a project design model. John Croft is one of the co-founders. He came to Germany when I was there to help train us in this and help us get, do some fundraising for the Institute. <clears throat> but I love that uh, this model has four aspects. It's a quadrant of dreaming, of doing. I can't remember the third one. Planning, thank you. And celebrating is the fourth one. So he says... of your energy and your resources should go towards celebrating. And he says when you're going to start a plan or a project, start with celebration. And I'll just read to you a little bit from this. He says, 
In Dragon Dreaming, celebration is part of the reflection of the introvert. This is because Dragon Dreaming is not about excessive consumption of alcoholic drinks, but more about gratitude, thanksgiving, recognition of effort and acknowledgement. It's about seeing the other person in their magnificence and glory, at the same time seeing their woundedness and brokenness. It's about acknowledging and honoring everything that went well in the project and everything that did not go so well. And in their booklet, they say, if it's not fun, it's not sustainable. So our work needs to be fun. So when he says, starting with celebration, he says, we have to ask ourselves the generative questions. How can we gather people together in a way that is fun, piques their curiosity, and motivates them to be part of what's happening? How can we create an environment that nurtures those involved, deepens their connections with each other, and leads to the recognition that we are all part of what happens around us? How can we encourage those persons who trivialize celebrating to join in and enjoy? So, if this talk is fun enough yet, but <laughs> why don't we listen to a bell? <laughs> Just feel our breathing. So I'll just say a little bit um, about leading and following, which has been a, a theme the past few days in our Enterprising Futures course. And then I'll give some time for sharing and discussion. Um, So, in the Buddhist teachings, there are three qualities of a, a true leader.
So there's the um, quality of cutting off afflictions. So the ability to <clears throat> not be controlled by your own suffering, to be able to see and uh, break out of um, your anger, your sadness, your discrimination, um, your irritation. The c- cutting off of afflictions is the first one. <coughs> cutting off afflictions, cutting off afflictions is the first aspect. The second. the second is loving, to be accepting, to be forgiving. And the third is understanding, okay. to be able to um, see the roots of what causes suffering and, and address that so that you don't keep repeating it. So this cutting off of afflictions is, is why that first circle is so important, right? To come back to yourself, to be able to loosen up the knots in us. And this loving, accepting, forgiving, this having a big heart, being able to see the good in others, uh, even if it's not always so visible. <laughs> um, that's like the second and the third circles, bringing this, <coughs> this sense of, of care and of um, benevolence to those in our lives. So, so this real authority comes from happiness comes from being someone who others find inspiring and fresh and interesting to be around. So not through coercion or um, force or because of your title, because of your position, right? So this is um, what Tai has said is the role of an abbot or an abbess in a community. It's also what I've heard people just say is the role of anybody in any leadership position. It's not to um, impose or to show themselves, but to draw out the talents of everyone in the group. That's really their role, is to help everyone in the group shine and be their best. So a teacher is not there to to put knowledge into students' minds, but to create an atmosphere of learning where what's in the student can arise. So it's uh, it's not hierarchical. And It's like a, a beehive. There's no leader in a beehive. There's no one bee telling all the other bees what to do. They just communicate well, and things get done. It's the same in an anthill. It's the same in our brain. There's no director in the brain telling all the cells what they need to do. They don't need that. And as our... Uh, Human society evolves. Um, We are going more and more in that direction of being self-directed, self-organizing, consensus-led. I don't know if some of you are familiar with Robert Gilman from the Context Institute. He um, was an astrophysicist and then went on to really study sustainability, one of the first organizations to study this globally, starting in the 70s. So this is what he uh, shares, that more and more we, we have more choice as society is Uh, evolving, and that he says, to me, this is analogous to nature's approach to organizing complexity. In natural systems, you have co-evolution and symbiosis. 
co-evolution being a dance of collaboration. We, we were doing tango all of yesterday morning as part of our course. And this dance of collaboration where we were really experiencing the, the need for the willingness of both parties for anything to happen. So you have a leader, you have a follower, but nothing happens if both people aren't centered in themselves. So it's not that one person gives away their agency to the other because they're leading. Both people have to really be strong. And even if you're following, you, in the tango, you, you determine the nature of your movement as you follow. You know, it's not uh, giving it away. And, and it really could only flow, it could flow best when both people um, were taking care of themselves. So it was really playing with this blur between leader and follower. That actually we all, we need to take care of ourselves first. That is taking care of the other person, right? We learned that the person leading the dance, you just do what you, what, you, what you need to do. And you invite the other person to follow, but you have to know and you have to be clear in yourself. And as a follower, you also, the more you, you, you just come into what your own experience is and are not trying to always guess or, you know, be led. It's, it's a funny thing, you're following, but you're, you're really leading as much as you're following. Mm. So anyway, Robert Gilman is saying that he sees us moving into this new, what he calls the planetary era and that it's moving towards self-organizing self consensual collaboration as the basis for social organization. You know, not, not force, not um, reward and punishment, but each of us saying, well, what is, it that, what is it that I need? This first circle coming back to myself so that I can really contribute the best of myself Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. And thank you for your listening. Uh.